please start, sir. We are live. Uh, good evening, everyone. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank On you. behalf of the special interest group of yes, early please. pregnancy, IFS. And today we are having a very focused CME or early pregnancy scan in collaboration with the Madhya Pradesh chapter of IFS and the Sagar Obs and Gaini Society. Just a few words about SIG early pregnancy group. I'm the convener of the group. I'm Dr. Piki Saxena and Dr. Renu Tanwar. She's a co-convener. And Dr. Renu is a professor in Maulana Azad Medical College. Dr. Aparna Sharma is the other co-convener and she's a professor at AIMS. And our advisor is Dr. Sonia Malik. And I think Madam is a very favorite teacher and a very known, well-known figure in the field of infertility. Needs no introduction. So now that we understand that the IVF pregnancy is a very high-risk pregnancy, we need to follow these patients very thoroughly and we need to do the scans in a very systematic and standardized way. There are so many crucial problems which are occurring during this time. The miscarriages, the ectopic pregnancy, molar pregnancy, repeated pregnancy loss. So we all need to ponder and put our brains together to build up a consensus on how to standardize the management of these pregnancies. Along with this, another very important uh, point which our group thought is, uh, should be taken up is the preconceptional counseling, which is a very neglected field and a missed opportunity. As we know that the organogenesis is occurring in the first trimester and early second trimester. So if we are able to uh, optimize the health of the mothers at this time. The, there will be no intrauterine programming, the epigenetic changes will not be there, and the transmission of these non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease will be reduced to a great extent. Other than that, we are also working on a survey uh, to know the prescription practices all over the country of uh, the IVF specialists and also the OBS and Gynae societies. And we have also encouraged the young uh, uh, practicing obstetricians and fellows to uh, bring up some papers on early pregnancy and the best five selected uh, papers will be given a chance to showcase their uh, uh, thesis or the research works in some IFS meetings. So with this, we had earlier uh, done last week only, we had done a focus CME on RPA, which was very well appreciated and was attended by a huge group of people. And before that, we had done another one with uh, the Stillbirth Society. So as the motto of uh, the IFS, Dr. KD Nair and Dr. Suveen has said, we need to collaborate with different societies so that we can all work together and bring these things, uh, uh, bring a common consensus between people. So today, I'm very happy. Will you share the uh, uh, PPT presentation, Dr. Bharti? I'm very happy today to have uh, Dr. K.D. Nair, please uh, move the slide with us. Uh, sir needs no introduction. He's a very well-known figure in the field of infertility and ART. And uh, sir is the current president on the, of the Indian Fertility Society 2022 to 24. Sir is a senior consultant and is heading the Akanksha IVF Center, Mata Chanandevi Hospital, New Delhi. He has a special interest in the poor responders. And he has done so much work. He has published and he has been an invited speaker for uh, 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 presenting his thoughts and experience in this field. He has attended a number of uh, international uh, symposia, webinars, conferences, and has done international uh, presentations in ESHRE meetings every year since 2017. Sir has been awarded so many times and is a, uh, has was awarded AS, uh, at the ASRM 2020 and 21. So with this, I welcome you again here, sir. And I request you to uh, say a few words, give your welcome address to the August campaign. Thank you, Piti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to welcome all the delegates to this uh, webinar being conducted by SIG Early Pregnancy. 
and i bring you greetings from the whole ifs family spread over 29 chapters all over india before i start i must to congratulate the work being done by this sag early pregnancy they have been quite active recently and they did a very nice webinar with stillbirth society and uh, last week they did with rpl i must to congratulate dr pikki saxena for taking the lead along with uh, dr renu tanwar and dr aparna sharma and my idea is i am very happy that pikki is still talking about collecting the data which we were looking to get the data from the survey which we can publish i think we have been in talk with dr suveen how to publish the data which you are collecting on the surveys and we are going to go forward with this and once we have a publication of our data that will give us more visibility to our society that is our main aim and our next uh, annual conference is coming in december 9 10 11 december in hyderabad i welcome you all to attend this conference it will be a excellent academic platform where you can have most interactive session from the international faculty and the renowned national faculty i welcome you all thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, now i would like to uh, introduce professor surveen human uh, i think she is a well known figure and does not need any introduction but i would uh, like to point out a few things madam has a 32 year experience in the field of infertility she has authored nine books three out of which have been published internationally she has more than 80 publications in journals and books and uh, she is the program director for fellowship in reproductive medicine at max hospital she is the executive editor of fertility science and research journal and she is uh, a peer reviewer for <clears throat> number of reputed journals madam at present is the secretary of the indian fertility society and has held several important academic posts in the past she is uh, also uh, has been awarded with numerous prestigious awards and i welcome ma'am she is a very very warm person very academic person and i have had a long associate uh, association with madam and uh, we are very happy to have you here ma'am welcome thank you thank you piki it's always a pleasure being on board with you thank you ma'am so uh, now i would invite dr bharti to proceed with the scientific session Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Priya Bhave, ma'am, uh, to introduce Dr. Jagriti, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Priya Bhave, ma'am, is consultant and head and department of reproductive medicine, Bansal Hospital, Bhopal. She has done. Uh, she is FNB reproductive medicine teacher. She is ex faculty of DM reproductive medicine. She has many Cochrane reviewer. She is Cochrane reviewer and author. I would like to welcome ma'am uh, to introduce Dr. Jagriti Nagar, ma'am. Ma'am, please. Uh, very good evening to all of you. At the outset, uh, I would want to thank he uh, for agreeing to host co-host this webinar with uh, MP chapter of IFS and uh, Dr. K D Nair and Dr. Surveen for always always helping us and always being with us in all our endeavors. it's such a pleasure to introduce jagruti she is not only a close friend but she has also been associated with me for such a long time she is the present president of sagar obstetric gynae society sagar society i would like to point out is one of the most active and one of the most awarded societies of mp although they have small numbers but they are so active that every time they win severious awards and they are one of the most academic societies of mp she uh, jagruti has several publications and has been invited faculty in several conferences and uh, she would be taking this uh, proceedings forward so jagruti welcome to this uh, cme and uh, please uh, carry the torch forward thank you dr priya didi for such a kind intro introduction thank you so much didi now i uh, welcome you all for this scientific session and i invite Uh, i introduce our first chair person dr jess jessie chokse ma'am she is 
uh, recently completed 47 year of private uh, 47 successful year of private practice see uh, madam is uh, our patron of uh, sagar of skyni society she is md of skyni gold medalist from bhopal uh, G, uh, gandhi medical college as private pra practitioner in sri ganesh nursing home president in uh, organizing mp state conference uh, in 2015 all mp of skyni um, conference now i um, well welcome our second chair person dr sadhna mishra ma'am she uh, madam is very warm person and she is uh, very active member of sagar of skyni society she is past president of ina sagar and past uh, president of uh, sagar of skyni society and uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Please unmute yourself. She is also past president of Sagar of Skyni Society, past president of IMA, and uh, she received many awards, Women Empowerment Award in two thousand nineteen at Goa, Wonder Foxian Award two thousand nineteen at Mumbai, and uh, she invented Gideon Sutcher. to practice uh, for postpartum hemorrhage management in uh, low setup resources i welcome dr shweta gupta medical director krista ivf <laughs> she uh, she is editor indian fertility society 22 to 24 joint treasurer ifs 20 uh, 22 rcog co opted member representative 2019 to 2022 assistant editor fertility science and research journal international rcog uk examiner welcome ma'am uh thank you sarvathi ma'am uh for uh, and uh, welcome to all the chair persons uh i would like to uh, well uh, i would like to introduce dr Jan Ch chandrakant garg sir uh, he is a fetal medicine consultant at jaipur fetal medicine and research center at uh, and his chair jaipur chair person imaging science and uh, science committee of jaipur obstetric and gynecology society he has done fellowship in fetal medicine and uh, from Bangalore Fetal Medicine Center. Uh, he has been certified for NTNB scans, anomaly scan, invasive procedures, fetal cardiography, echocardiography from Fetal Medicine Foundation UK. Uh, from Fetal Medicine Foundation UK. His areas of interest are fetal interventions, fetal echocardiography, neurosonogram, and fetal therapy. Uh, sir, I welcome you to give a talk on early pregnancy scan. Uh, some tips and tricks, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Arthi, for the kind uh, introduction, and thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Okay, is it my screen is visible? Yes. So, good evening, everyone. So, today we will discuss about the normal early pregnancy scan. so as we know the first trimester period is from the confirmation of the intrauterine pregnancy to 13 weeks 6 days we can broadly divide first trimester into two parts the early first trimester that is up to 10 week in that we know 
the pregnancy outcome as a embryo that is an embryonic period or, or period of organogenesis where the developmental uh, where the development of the internal and external system organs occurs during the first 10 week of the pregnancy so late first trimester that is commonly known as a anti nv scan time that is from 11 week to 13 week 6 days and the term we use in after 10 weeks that is a fetus so before going uh, for further we should know that gestation age what we use that is the menstrual menstrual age that is the pregnancy is dated from the day one of the lmp sometimes we use the conceptual age also when the when, when there the day one is uh, considered as a day of fertilization so how uh, the fetus is developed and what we see on the ultrasound in the development of the fetus so at uh, as early as 4 to 5 week when upt is positive on the tbs we can see the gestational sac from 6 to 10 week when when the embryo is uh, visible and the period of organogenesis where the embryo is surrounded by the amnion and the g sac is surrounded by the chorionic villi after 10 week the fetus is fully formed with placenta and the umbilical cord so what is the optimal time for the early pregnancy scan it is very important to know when the the woman is asymptomatic there is no previous history of ectopic or previous lscs and she has a regular cycle the ideal time to do a early pregnancy scan is around 7 week because if we do a, a earlier than uh, the final diagnosis we will end up in the early pregnancy of unknown location or that is intrauterine pregnancy of unknown viability but in some cases where we prescribe early pregnancy that in some symptomatic women where there is a bleeding or pain or previous history of ectopic pregnancy or any previous history of cesarean section so we can detect earlier the scar pregnancy so how to approach the uh, early pregnancy scan it is only via uh, trans abdominal scan or via the trans vaginal but it is better to do a trans abdominal scan followed by the tbs examination so both modality we should use for assessment of the early pregnancy as there is some difference between or some advantage or disadvantage advantage of both the uh, method so abdominal ultrasound that we can use the higher frequency but that visualization is poor but we can see the far structure better and the penetration is poor but we can see the surrounding structure uh, like adenexa and if there is something above the uterus in vaginal the the object is very area of interest is very near to the pro and we use the higher frequency so the visualization is very good for the near structure we get the good resolution of the area of interest like early pregnancy so in this you can see here that this is a trans abdominal ultrasound of a 6 week pregnancy hello yes yes go ahead okay so here we can see the trans abdominal scan this is the gestational sac seen here for the same patient on the t tvs we can see here this is nicely seen gestational sac with the trophoblastic reaction and the we can see the yolk sac also so this is a difference between tas and tvs in the earlier pregnancy this is a documentation of the tas and tvs how we see the early pregnancy this is around 6 and 5 6 week 5 days pregnancy on tas we cannot see anything other than the gestational sac but on tvs here we can see the clear the thickened endometrium there is uh, some collection in the endometrium also the gestational sac inside yolk sac embryo and the amniotic membrane also so what is the step for tvs so it is very important to know or we should proceed by step by step the first most important thing is to take a informed consent of the patient we can take orally but it is very important to take a consent of the patient before doing a tvs ask her to empty the bladder and ask her to lie down either in supine position it is better if you can uh, place her in dorsal lithotomy position and with the buttocks elevated by the cushion or the some pillow under the buttocks 
so it is very important to provide the privacy of her so we can have other staff and we can cover her lower part on the legs also so before doing all these things we should connect our tvs probe if it is not connect and tvs probe should be clean apply gel over the tip of the probe and cover this probe with a probe cover and apply gel outside the probe also but pay attention if there is uh, we are not creating any air bubble between the probe and and the probe cover and the the probe should be inserted gently and angulate inferiorly towards the rectum so so patient will not feel any pain or discomfort in between or during the procedure or we should ask the patient if there is uh, any discomfort and we should ask any uh, other problem if she has so these are the basic steps we should follow all in all uh, before doing all tvs as all you of uh, are doing and you all know other other important thing is safety of ultrasound in early pregnancy and for that we should use the alara principle as low as reasonably achievable principle that is very important to use the lowest possible power output and the shortest scan site scan time to limit the exposure of to, to the embryo so so generally we use b mode b mode for the scanning and m mode for the fetal cardiac activity these are the safest mode spectral doppler and color doppler generally we use when when there is some indication otherwise we don't use the spectral doppler and color doppler in the early pregnancy scan so now coming to the indication of the uh, ultrasound in early pregnancy the common indication are the amenorrhea when the patient does not know that she is pregnant or not if there is some pelvic pain or vaginal bleeding if she has irregular period or she is feeling that she is pregnant otherwise we can take a uh, clinical evaluation also if uterus is larger or smaller than the dates then also we can uh, ask for the early pregnancy scan definitely upt positive is an indication for the early pregnancy scan so what is the objective of early pregnancy scan when we do a early pregnancy scan we should uh, keep in mind that first thing to confirm the pregnancy that if she is pregnant or not the uterus is gravid or not after that we have to localize the gestational sac if gestational sac is there the what other uh, component or other milestone of uh, pregnancy is achieved so confirmation of viability if there is fetal uh, there is embryo is visible in case of multiple pregnancy we need to define the chorionicity or amenorrhicity in multiple pregnancies and it is very important to document if there is single gestational gestational sac or two gestational sac or multiple gestational sac in in uh, uh, in multiple gestation it is important because this is a best time to uh, define the chorionicity at least after that assessment of the gestation or dating is important if patient is uh, having irregular period or there is a discrepancy in the her lmp and her uh, by her gestational age so assessment of normal embryo and gestational sac before 10 week we do and detection of early sign of pregnancy failure is also we can see in the early pregnancy now coming to the key component how we do early pregnancy scan or what should we see on the early pregnancy scan so first most important thing first we have to do a survey that is good to keep half full bladder of the patient and do a tas times abdominal scan and do a survey so we can see the whole uh, uh, uterus and adnexa and along with the uh, adnexal masses or if there is any so location then then to proceed for the transvaginal sonography so it is important to locate the pregnancy whether whether it is intrauterine or it is extrauterine if it is single or multiple the presence of gestational sac presence of yolk sac or presence of embryo that also should be documented after that we we need to check the viability of the pregnancy if she is uh, the pregnancy is viable or not if it is not then what to uh, when to call if uh, she require another scan after one week or two weeks amniotic sac and coronary cavity we can document we can see we can measure also this is also important so that's to do a early placenta that form around 9 to 10 weeks 
but we don't uh, comment on placenta before eight to nine weeks. So it is uh, just for the uh, our knowledge that that uh, the, the decidua is normal. Now coming to the dating of the pregnancy, for that we have to take the measurement of the gestational sac. We have to take the CRL and other things. Also important to recognize the sign of early pregnancy loss to prognosticate the pregnancy in case of any symptomatic patient. And it is very important to see the uterus other than, uh, sorry, uh, at adnexal mastase or adnexa and uh, ovaries other than uterus also, because there is a chances of heterotopic pregnancy also or multiple pregnancy uh, in, in multiple sites also. So this is uh, a survey we can see here, this is a, uh, a trans abdominal scan and show, this is showing a gestational uh, sac and we can see here the anteriorly there is a large uh, fibroid that is protruding in the uh, urinary bladder here and in other clip we can see he, this is the intrauterine pregnancy which there is a multiple cyst in the periphery, uh, periphery and uh, of the decidua and uh, in this there, there is a ovarian cyst and in another picture is there is a normal corpus luteum. So now coming to ultrasound uh, pictures of early pregnancy, when we do ultrasound in very early pregnancy, like four to five weeks, so we see a decidualized endometrium like this. And this is the part where, where the blastocyst emptied after 10 days of the fertilization. And the first evidence of pregnancy on ultrasound is a, a gestational age that is completely embedded on, on eccentrically located on the uh, decidualized endometrium. So, so as early as uh, four weeks and one day, we can see the gestational sac on TVS and that is around two to three mm uh, uh, at, at four to five weeks uh, of the pregnancy. This is a very small, tiny, hypoechoic or anechoic round fluid filled correction inside the uterine cavity within the decidualized endometrium. And this is actually known as an intradecidual sign, sac sign. So we will discuss about that in coming slides. Normally the position of the sac is mid to upper uterine cavity and sometimes it is in lower uterine cavity. So we also discuss about the lower, lower sac or implication of the lower uh, implantation. Mostly it is surrounded by the hyper echogenic rim that is a trophoplastic uh, reaction and the mean sac diameter growth or the, the, the growth rate of the gestational sac is around 1, one mm per day. So initially the gestational sac appears as a round a smooth wall with a regular edges in uh, early pregnancy but later in gestation become oval but it maintain the smoothness and the regular walls with the ecogenic rim. So once we have seen the gestational sac that is inside the uterine cavity, so what next? What we need to check about the gestis there? First, we need to check that it is a true gestational sac or it is a pseudo gestational sac or this is something else. Other thing is location, where it is located. So it is located in the mid part or the upper part of the uterus. That means it is good. But if it is low implantation or if the sac is low, then we have to check the history. If she has previous cesarean section, then we have to document this and we have to take the distance of the lower border of the sac to the external os. Other thing is once we have seen the gestational sac, it is important to measure the gestational sac. So coming to the uh, each thing. Now the true gestation sac initially uh, in 1980s, the intradecidual sign and the double sex sign was, was uh, proposed for the sign to diagnose as a true gestational sac, but these sign actually uh, not much reliable. And nowadays with high frequency probe, TVS probe, the yolk sac may be visible prior to we see the double double sac sign or the intradecidual sign. And subsequent studies shows that in the normal intrauterine pregnancy, the double sac sign may be absent and also the intradecidual sign may be absent in about 50% of the cases. So what is intradecidual sign? We have seen the decidualized endometrium and we can see here the this is the 
gestational sac so gestational sac generally implanted over the uh, embedded in the upper or mid part of the uterus uterine cavity on the eccentric location of the one side of the endometrium so this is known as a intradecidual sign after some some days this gestational sac enlarge and enlarging uh, of gestational sac the protrude into the uterine cavity and it create a two ecogenic line around the gestational sac so this is known as a double decidual sign the inner line is a, a decidual capsularis and the outer line is decidual vesalis in between two there is some a little fluid we can see here this is a, a, a hypoechoic area this is the fluid between these two so this is useful for confirmation of the intrauterine pregnancy on on transabdominal scan before G, before you eox sac c but now with advent of newer technology newer machines and high resolution probes and high frequency probes we can see eox sac much earlier than then these sign visible so coming to uh, to differentiate true gestational sac from the pseudo gestational sac so pseudo gestational sac is a central locations has central location and also seen in 20% of ectopic pregnancies but it is important to see here the the pseudo gestational sac has a pointed end or acute angle or the weak appearance also when we move the probe the pseudo gestational sac also move with the probe pressure so this is how we differentiate two gestational sac from the other thing other things also we can see the desodorant cyst also in uh, in in the uterine cavity that uh, that are thin walled and usually basal in location you can see and this can be happen or this can be seen with the intrauterine pregnancy ectopic pregnancy or in even the non pregnant uterus also but there is no ecogenic rim around that there is no ecogenic rim around that and that can be single or multiple so it is very important to see these all these things so till now we have seen normal gestational sac early we have seen uh, to differentiate a uh, true gestation sac from the decidual cyst pseudo sac and other things so now little bit discuss about the low gestation sac when we see the 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 uh, lower end of the gestation sac is less than 5 cm from the external loss it is known as a low gestation sac and this is study shown that that the patient with no previous history of lscs they they don't have any placenta previa but the patient with with uh, previous lscs the chances of they having placenta previa is 25% among the uh, low low gestational sac and they conclude this is study if the distance is less than 4 cm from external loss with history of previous lscs and placenta previa the chances of having placenta accreta is around 60% so this is very important to to uh, to document the location of gestational sac while doing the early pregnancy scan now coming to the measurement of the gestational sac why it is important to take the measurement the first important thing to take uh, uh, for measurement is to estimate the gestational age is sometime the patient is uh, the, the she has a, a irregular cycle so we need to document the gestational age at the time when we are looking for the early pregnancy scan also it is important to 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 predict the appearance of normal embryonic structure if we are looking for early gestational sac that is around 5 weeks so we know if after 5 week uh, at 5 week gestational sac is appear so after 1 week or 2 week what we will see in another scan also it is important to prognose prognosticate the pregnancy if the gestational sac is smaller than the gestational uh, gestational age by her menstrual period and the difference between the gestational sac and crl is less than 5 mm that means this is first trimester oligohydramnios and this is this is associated with the poor outcome then poor outcome that means that can be a spontaneous loss of uh, pregnancy and also there is chance of uh, there is increased chance of the low birth weight baby so this is all about the measurement so how to take the measurement of the gestational sac so it is a important to take the measurement and correct in correct way we need to check in two sections to a different plane on the right angle and we take three 
orthogonal planes and we take the mean of all these three that measurement is inner to inner from inner to inner of all three and all three should be added and divided by three to take the mean set diameter this is a wrong way to take the two method uh, two measurement or it is also wrong way to take the longest or diameter of the gestational set the expected rate of growth already we have discussed this is 1 mm per day if the rate is uh, slower than that or if the shape is distorted or it is uh, or, or or the ecogenic ecogenicity is a weak that means that is a abnormal gestational set so all about the gestational sac then we see a gestational sac or empty gestational sac that should be considered as a normal early pregnancy finding when this is up to uh, 25 mm of the mean sac diameter so so it is very important or a sac without visible yolk sac or embryo that can be considered normal until unless we have seen twice uh, after some uh, like recommended period of two weeks now coming to the next visible or uh, sign of the pregnancy so so yolk sac is a first definitive confirmation of intrauterine pregnancy and normally is seen around 5.5 week gestation when the mean sac diameter is 5 to 6 mm usually or we see always yolk sac when the mean sac diameter reaches around 8 mm and this image 3 to 5 days prior to embryo so after after once the uh, yolk sac appear we expect that after 5 minimum 5 3, 3 to 5 days the embryo will be uh, appear so this is a thin ecogenic this is a thin ecogenic circular ring that within the gestational sac usually located eccentrically and the normal yolk sac diameter is around 4 to 5 mm and that is sometimes is up to 6 mm but the more than 6 mm is uh, a enlarged gestation sac and that is associated with the poor outcome another important thing is we need to check the number of yolk sacs sometimes that, that the yolk sac uh, gestation sac is single or one gestation sac but there is a two uh, yolk sac so if yolk sac are two that means there is a two amnion so the pregnancy may be the monochorionic type amniotic so so another thing when we see the yolk sac that yolk sac is a secondary yolk sac because the primary yolk sac is almost disrupted at around 4 week and this is extruded so what we see on ultrasound that is a secondary yolk sac so secondary yolk sac appearance is around at 6 week 7 week 8 week and 9 week this is a uh, also it is important to uh, know so this is uh, this will be discussed by dr smita ma'am in uh, coming lecture now next visible sign of the early pregnancy scan is the amnion that is seen around 5.5 week onwards there is a small membranous structure that that is continuous with the with the feed uh, embryo and that contain a clear fluid inside this separate the embryo from the extra embryonic silo and this this amniotic cavity or amnion rapidly grow after 10 weeks and it, this this is uh, almost fused with the chorion around 14 to 16 week so here we can see this is a uh, single intrauterine pregnancy with the single uh, yolk sac and the uh, amniotic cavity here you can see the this is a yolk uh, single gestational sac with the two embryo and the two amniotic cavity so so it is important to check the uh, chorionicity or amniotic in the multiple pregnancy here we can see this is a lambda sign we all know that this is a two gestational sac two embryo two amniotic cavity this is a dichorionic diamniotic pregnancy here we can see there is a single gestational sac with the two yolk sacs but there is no intervening membrane it is it is possible that we cannot see the intervening membrane or amniotic uh, membrane as early in 6 or 7 week so we need to repeat the uh, ultrasound and here we can see this a t sign or in this we can see this is a monochorionic diamniotic pregnancy so it is good to document that uh, amniotic or of the pregnancy at early pregnancy scan 
so this is are the these are these are clipping showing the the dcda twin pregnancy and this is a tcta twin pregnancy tcta triplet pregnancy so in this tcda we can see two gestational sac with two embryo two yolk sac and a two amniotic cavity and in the tcta triplet pregnancy we can see here this is a mercedes benz sign and uh, three distinct gestational sac with three embryo and yolk sac sometimes we can get some this type of images also where where this is a dcda twin pregnancy with normally growing embryo in the one sac but the other sac is empty this is this is a where we can see this is a double black sign where there is no fetus this is a yolk sac and this is a amniotic cavity where we cannot see any embryo so this is a uh, empty amnion sign also known as this is a 3d picture of this this showing that this is a small gestational sac and this is a normal pregnancy going on so when we see all these thing so we expect to appear the embryo at around 5 week and initially the embryo seen as a diamond ring when where, where the yolk sac appear at the one edge of the uh, yolk sac the embryo appear as the one edge of the yolk sac and this appear as a diamond ring so it is recognized at 2 to 3 mm by high resolution tvs pro and in this cardiac activity usually present uh, around 6 to 6 6 week and 5 days when the crl is around 5 to 7 mm so 7 7 mm is a cut off for the crl uh, cardiac activity we can calculate or measure the crl crown rump length by trans abdominal scan or tvs and bo both both are okay crl defined as a longest length that exclude the limbs and the yolk sac so initially the the embryo is laminar or linear appearance before 7 weeks but after 7 week the appearance of the fetus uh, embryo is changed to the kidney shape or like little bit curvy, curvy so once we have seen the embryo we, we need to document the heart rate if it is uh, uh, present or if it is not present so we use m mode generally to document the heart rate after that we measure the crl to date the pregnancy and the crl is the best way to date the pregnancy and it is very important after all these things if it is uh, you have a good resolution probe or tvs probe to assess the morphology of the fetus or the embryo at early so we can detect some uh, major defect or major abnormality at at early anomaly scan also so embryonic cardiac activity is visible as soon as the embryo is detectable and we can see generally uh, it, with high resolution or good machines uh, when crl is around 1 mm or 2 mm but but uh, embryonic cardiac activity is universally uh, identified by crl of 4 to 5 mm and and the absence of embryonic cardiac activity generally do not consider abnormal when when the embryo is less than 7 mm so the 7 mm of crl is the cut off for the uh, uh, the embryonic cardiac activity and mostly we use the m mode the normal range of the cardiac activity is 100 beat per minute up to 6.2 weeks and 120 beat per minute between 6.3 weeks to 7 weeks so this is the all about the current cardiac activity so how to uh, take the crl that is very important the crl is a, is a crown to rump length that is the greatest length measured in straight line that is before 6 7 weeks 6 to 7 weeks so we can take the longest length of the embryo but after 7 week the embryo measurement it is better to take in when 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 embryo is in sagittal section like this this is kidney shape embryo and this is the crown to rump length complete length it is good but this is difficult to 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 see the neutral position uh, in the early pregnancy scan and it is very important to not to include the yolk sac or the limb birds or limb parts 
in, in the CRL. So, so CRL is already, we have discussed this and CRL is the most accurate way of dating a, a pregnancy with ultrasound. So this is how uh, the embryo appear uh, in six week, seven week, eight week and onwards. So this is a changes uh, as a pre pregnancy advance. So this is 3D uh, depiction of the amniotic sac. This is a yolk sac and this is a chorion. This is the fetus and the umbilical cord also seen uh, at the end of nine and 10 week. So when we see pregnancy or intrauterine pregnancy, it is always good to document the corpus luteum also, if it is corpus luteum cyst, uh, normal or if it is uh, enlarged. So here, this is a normal intrauterine pregnancy with a hemorrhagic uh, corpus luteal cyst, and this is a normal uh, corpus luteal cyst. It is also important to differentiate ectopic gestational sac with the corpus luteum. As we can see here, this is a corpus luteum and this is a ectopic gestation sac. In the ectopic gestation, there is a ecogenic rim all around the, uh, the hypoechoic area that, that is not visible in this corpus luteum. So, this is all about the early pregnancy scan. Now, I, I, uh, in few slides, I just want to uh, show you that a morphology of early pregnancy scan is also possible. And we can see much more thing or any uh, lethal or abnormalities that we can detect uh, at, the live, uh, at the early pregnancy scan. So this is a eight week around pregnancy. And here we can see the the two parallel line here, the, these are the spine of the baby. So it is very important if we can detect the major spinal defect or abnormality. And this is also important to see here. This is a rhomban kephalon. This is not a uh, uh, any cyst in the fetal, uh, sorry, embryonal, embryonal head. This is a normal posterior fossa that is rhomban kephalon. So this is, we should familiar to the, these normal finding also. We can, we can diagnose the, uh, some early high drops also. So this is uh, around eight week pregnancy and we can see this is a, a hydropic baby. This is a bilateral, almost uh, pleural effusion here. And uh, there is generalized high drops all around the fetus. And this pregnancy uh, is not continued. So at nine week, the, the, the heartbeat is stopped itself actually. So sometimes we diagnose some uh, abnormality that we think this is an abnormal bun, but that is not abnormal bun. In this case, we can see here uh, at around nine weeks and four days, there is some protrusion from the abdominal cavity and we can diagnose is an exome fellows, but at nine weeks and four days, it is not to, it is not to good, like not, uh, a diagnosis of exome fellows because sometimes this is a physiological hernia and this this uh, revert back to the abdomen at around 11 weeks or sometimes it is late in the 12 weeks also. So this is also we need to check. We should not terminate the pregnancy that we are seeing the exome fellows here. So now uh, at the end of my talk, I just want to uh, brief the chronology of the EP event on PBS. The gestation sex should be seen around five to six weeks and yolk sex should be seen around six to seven weeks in 100% of the pregnancy. And embryonal heart rate, normally we see six to seven weeks. And after seven weeks, it should be seen in each and every pregnancy. So, so to summarize my talk, the TAS, trans abdominal ultrasound, and the trans vaginal ultrasound, the both, both are very important, complementary each, to each other for the complete early pregnancy scan. The general survey of uterus and adnexa is very important. We need to recognize the ultrasound landmark of the early pregnancy scan so we can uh, prognosticate the pregnancy. Dating is also important when to call her in the uh, further scan or for the NT or NB scan. And if it is possible, look for the early morphology of the embryo so we can detect the major lethal abnormality at the early pregnancy scan. So thank you so much for your kind uh, patience to hear you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for helping us become more aware about the topic. It was very, very knowledgeable presentation, sir. Thank you so much.
and uh, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, now I would like to welcome Dr. Smita Dengle, ma'am. Uh, she is uh, she's MBBS DGO DNB. Uh, she has a fellowship in fetal medicine. Fet she is at present fetal medicine specialist at Bansal Hospital, Bhopal. Uh, she has she has been certified for NT scan, anomaly scan, and invasive procedures uh, via FM FMF uh, UK. Uh, she is member of ISUOG, uh, life member of Society of Fetal Medicine, and member of uh, Foxy of Imaging uh, Com Science Committee. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to welcome you for the talk on diagnosis of first trimester miscarriage. Ma'am, welcome. Thank you very much, Parthi, for that kind introduction. A very good evening to everybody. And I must thank uh, Dr. Chandrakan for his extensive lecture. He has really put a set up a nice stage. And I think everybody is now aware of the early pregnancy scan so that I can speak further about the diagnosis of the miscarriage or I would say the complications that may happen in the first trimester or the early scans. Is my screen visible to everybody? Is my screen visible? It's visible. Yes, Just ma yes ma And is it on presentation mode now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So the key points for my lecture now will be early pregnancy complications. They are most common reason to seek a medical care at 8 to 11 weeks. We should all know that TVS is the standard method. Pregnancy of unknown location and pregnancy of unknown viability, they are not the diagnosis. So we have to look further into this. Please always remember a second opinion scan or a repeat scan is always welcome and at times it is mandatory. And ultrasound along with serum hormone levels, they are the saviors, they are our guides. So how do I define the miscarriage? Loss of pregnancy before 13 completed weeks of pregnancy is miscarriage. And the incidence in clinical pregnancy is around 20%, but it can be up to 13 to 38% in biochemical pregnancies. So as Dr. Chandrakant has nicely explained about the early pregnancy normal scans, I'll skip this. But CRL is important in diagnosing miscarriage and dating of pregnancy that I will reiterate. A viable intrauterine pregnancy when, when we see the cardiac activity. And there's a scoring system for prediction of this miscarriage in the first trimester. And there are various combination of factors such as maternal age, gestational age, the bleeding score, the mean gestation and the yolk sac sizes and the presence of embryonic cardiac activity. They all help us in accurate prediction of viability. So I need to have a cardiac activity documented. Now clinical miscarriage, they can happen around one in five recognized pregnancies. And once I've seen the cardiac activity and then a miscarriage happening, the incidence may be two to six. ultrasound factors, they are known to be associated with higher likelihood of miscarriage. And let me tell you, the inappropriate terms such as pregnancy failure or incompetent cervix, they can contribute to negative self-perceptions and they can worsen any sense of failure, shame, guilt or insecurity. So the recommended medical term for pregnancy loss under 24 weeks is miscarriage. So we have the terminologies now. Like earlier, it was said spontaneous miscarriage, threatened abortion, inevitable abortion, incomplete, everything as abortion. Now the recommended term is miscarriage as threatened miscarriage, inevitable miscarriage, incomplete or complete miscarriage, or early fetal demise, delayed miscarriage. So the word miscarriage has to be there, not the abortion. We call it as a biochemical pregnancy loss when the pregnancy is not located on the scan. We call it an empty sac when the sac is there with absent or minimal structures inside it. Dr. Chandrakant has given you each and every detail of every structure that we see inside the gestation sac. If a fetal loss, we have to label it. It is like previous CRL measurement with subsequent loss of fetal heart activity. When it is less than 12 weeks and no fetal heart activity, we call it as an early pregnancy loss. 
A late pregnancy loss when the pregnancy is more than 12 weeks and pregnancy of unknown location when no identifiable pregnancy on scan with positive beta HCG. All this has been recommended by the ESHRAE Special Interest Group of Early Pregnancy. Now let us talk about the pregnancy of unknown location. A lady walks into my OPD with beta HCG positive or a urine pregnancy test positive. I do her scan. This is a TVS scan image. And there are no signs of either intrauterine or extrauterine pregnancy or retained products of conception in a woman with positive pregnancy tests. What do I do further? This is not the diagnosis. They can be 7 to 30 percent of them may be ectopic pregnancy. So management of pregnancy of unknown location is now centered on assigning the risk. It can be low risk when it can be a failing pregnancy of unknown location or a persistent pregnancy of unknown location or an early intrauterine pregnancy. So I need to follow this up. It can be a high risk pregnancy even if it is an ectopic pregnancy. So I have to look for further things. Risk is evaluated using serum biochemistry. The first thing that I would see is what is a serum beta HCG level. So there is a regression model, M4 logistic regression model. Don't get scared by the name. What it basically says is we have to see the initial serum beta HCG level and the HCG ratio. How do I take out this HCG ratio? I need to have an initial one and then 48 hours later. And use of this model, it reduces the follow-up in 70% of the follow of the pregnancies of unknown location, and it has a negative predictive value of around 97.5%. And it is it has been put into practice, and then it is found that this M4 model is better than both the HCG ratio and the progesterone alone. Now, the low-risk pregnancy of unknown locations, they require minimal follow-up. I can do UPT in two weeks or a repeat ultrasound in one week. But if it is a high-risk pregnancy of unknown location, it may require further ultrasound scans and measurement of serum beta HCG more frequently. So how do I triage them? First of all, I'll have to see whether the lady is hemodynamically stable or not. Is she having any complaint of pain or not? So if she's stable and pain is there, I have to see serum beta HCG. According to her status and my setup, I can consider laparoscopy. If she is hemodynamically unstable, my extreme right. If she is unstable and pain, then I have to have a laparoscopy or laparotomy, whatever my setup allows. But if she is pain free and she is hemodynamically stable as well, then I can think of expectant management. I see her serum beta HCG level at zero hour, that means now, which I consider as zero hour. And then serum beta HCG levels is 48 hours. And then I see what is the difference. Now, if the, there is a decrease in this serum beta HCG level and this decrease is more than 13%, then the likely diagnosis that I would make is failed pregnancy of unknown location. And I will follow her up uh, by a urine pregnancy test in two weeks, repeat serum beta HCG if positive. If suppose it is increasing, then I'll see whether it is increasing more than 66%. Then I'll have a likely diagnosis of a normal intrauterine pregnancy. I can repeat her TVS on day seven. If suppose the increase is there, but it is less than 66%, then the probability of ectopic pregnancy is there. I will see what is the HCG level when it is expected to be more than 1000 international unit per liter. And I can repeat her TVS that day and on day seven and follow her with her symptoms and signs. Suppose there is a decrease, but that decrease is less than 13%. So it can be a failed pregnancy of unknown location or a possible ectopic pregnancy. So I have to repeat her HCG on day seven and scan accordingly. So the scan as well as the serum beta HCG levels, they help me to triage and monitor the pregnancy of unknown location. Coming on to pregnancy of unknown viability. So it can be a early viable pregnancy or it may be a slow growing pregnancy that is destined to miscarry. So when do I call it as pregnancy of unknown viability? When I've done a TVS and I find an intrauterine sac, but the mean sac diameter is less than 25 millimeter and there's no yolk sac or no embryonic bone. That means it's only the sac and less than 25 millimeter. Or I see a sac which is less than 25 millimeter with a yolk sac and no embryonic bone. Or there is an embryo, but it is less than seven millimeter and there's no visible heartbeat. 
So they all go into category of unknown viability. But then this is also not my diagnosis. I have to wait and follow this pregnancy. I'll repeat the scan in 10 days or 14 days. And then I'll see what happens next to this pregnancy. So the ultrasound features that increase the suspicion of likely pregnancy failure will be subchorionic hematoma or a small gestation sac or an enlarged yolk sac. Just now we heard a beautiful lecture. Now miscarriage, when do I label it as? When the empty gestation sac of mean sac diameter 25 millimeter or more, or I see an embryo whose CRL is 7 millimeter or more without a heartbeat. And these are the safer criteria because earlier there had been different measurements given, but then there were many errors that were happening. So the metacentric trial has said that this MSD of 25 millimeter and a CRL of 7 millimeter without embryonic heartbeat, there are a safer criteria to base our diagnosis and there's a minimal risk of error. But mind you, these criteria are to be used when we are doing a TBS scan. And definitely now we have a clear idea that transvaginal scan gives us better images, better, uh, better view of the pregnancy. A complete miscarriage when there's a previously noted intrauterine pregnancy and now after pain and bleeding, now when we're repeating the scan, the cavity is empty. And an incomplete miscarriage when I find irregular heterogeneous echo within the endometrial cavity. But then incomplete miscarriage, when do I label it as? What is the criteria that I use? So the endometrial thickness that we use, so there has been multiple papers which say, do we use 10 millimeter or 15 millimeters? But then the systematic review says that the diagnostic accuracy of endometrial thickness of 15 millimeter or more did not lead to solid result because it cannot be, it cannot be conclusively said whether it is incomplete or complete. So now it is said that we should put our power droplet. It is of value. There's a significant vascularity in the retained tissue as opposed to the blood clot. So whenever a lady comes with pain, vaginal bleeding, a pregnant lady, then I need to know if I label it as an incomplete miscarriage. Apart from the endometrial thickness, I put my color doppler or power doppler and I see what is the vascularity. The differential diagnosis that I need to have or keep in mind is blood clot within the, within the endometrial cavity, but then it will be non-vascular. It can be endometritis, it can be gestational trophoblastic disease or a very rare kind of a thing, uterine arteriovenous malformation, the Next image, which I've put, where prominent blood flow is present and it is usually centered in the myometrium. Here, we will find it near the endometrium when there are tissues. Serum progesterone is yet another thing that helps us, but single serum progesterone measurement predicts the non viability, cutoff values being 3.2 to 6 nanogram per ml. But then there is a limitation to use this progesterone level for the triage because it allocates most viable intrauterine pregnancies into high risk category. And it misclassifies more ectopic pregnancies as low risk as compared with serum beta HCG triage. So it's better that we concentrate on serum beta HCG and the ultrasound findings. Next thing that we can't come across in early pregnancy uh, complications is a molar pregnancy because they also come with pain, bleeding, passage of tissues. So they present in a very similar way to the miscarriage only. Vaginal bleeding being the most common. A complete molar pregnancy will show a complex intrauterine ecogenic mass with cystic spaces. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But, but a partial molar pregnancy, they're more commonly diagnosed as miscarriages because it will have the placenta with the ecogenic mass, cystic spaces and the fetal tissue as well. So the most common problem or most common uh, mistake that most of us make is incomplete miscarriage. But keep the diagnosis of partial moral pregnancy also into consideration when we see early pregnancy complication scans. These hydropic changes in a miscarriage is the difficult thing which makes us go think uh, more in terms of incomplete miscarriage. Recurrent miscarriage is one thing, I'll just make a passing remark over here because it is in itself a separate topic where we can have a separate webinar. SIG recently had one. So loss of two or more pregnancies is uh, called as a recurrent miscarriage, but it's very important that it is not necessary to be consecutive ones. 
And in the latest ASR, ASRM practice committee opinion, they have said that a pregnancy is defined as a clinical pregnancy documented by ultrasonography or histopathologic examination. And it has to be a clinical pregnancy, which we say that it's a clinical pregnancy loss. Ectopic pregnancy, we all know, it is implantation of the fertilized ovum outside the endometrial cavity, and it is potentially life-threatening. So it is very important to keep our eyes open for it. Tubal, most of the time, over 90% of the ectopic pregnancy is their tubal ectopics. But at the same time, think about non-tubal ectopic. Though they are rare, but we never know, we might be seeing one. Non-tubal ectopics, why are we so much worried about them? Because they have a disproportionate level of morbidity. And they often present relatively late and they may be difficult to diagnose. They can be interstitial, cervical, a cesarean scar uh, pregnancy, heterotopic pregnancies, ovarian pregnancy, or abdominal pregnancy. We will deal more with ectopic pregnancy in our panel. So the take home message from my talk would be, transvaginal sonography is the cornerstone of the management of the women with early pregnancy complications. Clear understanding of the behavior of serum beta HCG and progesterone is the requirement. We have to treat the women, not the ultrasound scans. And clinical status of the woman is paramount. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, now I would like to welcome all our chairpersons uh, to give their expert advice on the same on the topic early pregnancy scans. Tata, ma'am, please unmute yourself. Vicky, shall I, uh, shall I, I think, uh, am I visible? Dr. Shweta, you are not very uh, visible, but we can hear you. You can yes. make your com expert oh, comment. I think very, you know, very nice talks by both Dr. Garg and Dr. Uh, Smita. Uh, very important tips have been given and also very, you know, it was uh, with a lot of videos and pictures. So it was very much easy to understand and a very sensible statement, which Dr. Smita said that, you know, uh, we have to treat the patient. So I think it is very important that we keep the clinical picture in ultrasound and keep our mind open and you know put everything together so uh, uh, I, it's an excellent talk by both of them i think there was a lot of points to learn uh, thank you very much dr smitha and dr Garg. thank you and thank you dr surveen you are muted i would like to put in a comment i think both the lectures were wonderful Dr. Garg explained it so well. I think this should be, you know, the, this lecture should be uh, uh, done pan India because it is the basic lecture which a gynecologist needs. And every infertility person needs that. How big is the sac? When do you see the thing? Although we may all know it, but we all need to have it, you know, reiterated with us. And the second lecture was also very good. Unfortunately, I had to go somewhere in the middle, so I couldn't hear the whole thing. <laughs> but Dr. Gar's lecture, I have heard the complete lecture, and I think uh, this is something which, Piki, you should probably organize pan India. Yes. With all the chapters. We will, definitely. That was the idea, Dr. Subin, that we have to standardize. It has to be known to all the gynecologists, all obstetricians, how to start from the basics, and he has gone to all the intricacies. Yes. Also, yes. The details. And uh, we did not understand so many things coming back again, following up the patient, clinical picture, correlation, and uh, biochemical correlation, all and those so things. Really, it, it, so has well. it, mm. it has been done before the talk. It is a wonderful very lecture. Good. Wonderful. Very nice. So, Thank uh, you very much. I think Piki probably you could plan something yes. which uh, you can take it across all the chapters. Yeah. And uh, can uh, repeat this. Yeah. Very nice session. And uh, thank you, Priya. You've been great in circulating a lot of CMEs. <laughs> Dr. Priya is uh, 
I think Abhi. Yes. She must have gone back to OT. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was in a OT dress, so maybe yes. she yes. got back. Got a call or something. So, Dr. Bharti, you can carry on if there is no other question or comments. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for honoring us with your presence. And uh, we'll move forward uh, with our uh, webinar. Uh, so, uh, we'll move forward with panel discussion uh, that is on uh, interesting scenarios and early pregnancy scan. First, this would be moderated by Dr. Smita, ma'am and Dr. P.K. Saxena, ma'am. First of all, I would like to introduce Dr. P.K. Saxena, ma'am. Uh, uh, she is a director and professor of Ops and Gynecology Gynec, in Lady Harding Medical College, uh, New Delhi. She has won ma uh, many gold medals and awards and best research work in national and international conferences, including CS Dawn Award, Award twice. And she has edited uh, more, um, four books and published many articles. She is a uh, she has expert. She was expert group member of Drug Controller General of India. Uh, she is governing council member of DIPSI, executive member of Indian Fertility Society, and uh, she is also a member of IPSR. Oh, so, so, that is enough. You can go ahead. <laughs> okay. uh, welcome, ma'am. And we will move forward with the panel discussion. Uh, now, ma'am, stage is all yours. These are the panelists. Please introduce the panelists. Uh, the pan uh, uh, Dr. Smita Dubey, ma'am. Uh, she is MBBS DGO, uh, currently working at obstetrician and gynecology in Kilkari Hospital, Sagar. Uh, did have MBBS and uh, DGO from uh, Jabalpur, uh, NSCB Medical College, Jabalpur. And she is past secretary and president of Sagar Obstetric and Gynecological Society. She has special interest in adolescents. Our second panelist is Dr. Nidhi Mishra, ma'am. Uh, she is currently working as consultant and uh, consultant in lapro uh, obstetric and gynecology, laparoscopic surgeon, and sonologist in Siva Hospital, Sagar. She is present president of Sagar Obstetric and Gynecological Society. Uh, she has done her MBBS from GNC Bhopal and uh, uh, obstetric MD from Raipur, Chhattisgarh. She has awarded with FICOG in 2016. She has attended many state level and national level conferences. She has received many gold medals. She has special interest in infertility and high risk pregnancy. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, our third panelist is Dr. Chagriti Kiran Nagar, ma'am. Uh, she has already, uh, she is present, president SOG's, uh, SOG, MB, MB, uh, she's M done her MBBS, MS and FICOG, uh, designated as associate professor in Gynec department in BMC Sagar. She is organizing, com in organizing committee in AMPOGS and as pre uh, SOGS president in 2016. Uh, our next, um, our next uh, panelist is Dr. Ruby Reja, ma'am. She she is MBBS DGO. She is MBBS from Medical College Kanpur and DGO from Upper India uh, Sugar uh, Change Maternity Hospital. Uh, she has won three national mm -hmm. awards uh, while being secretary SOGS. Won all uh, four national awards while being president of SOGS. Uh, she is then uh, she has done master trainer of uh, Dira program. Uh, she is uh, an active member of Foxy IMA. She has special interest in high-risk pregnancy and adolescent health programs and infertility. Our last panelist is Dr. Renu Tanwar, ma'am. She is professor and IVF coordinator. Uh, she, is, um, she is visiting fellow at Mercy Hospital, Melbourne, Australia. Australia. Visiting, visiting fellow in Stemville uh, University and uh, visiting fellow in, uh, at University Hospital, Brazil. Uh, has organized CMEs and conferences uh, on IVF and reproductive techniques on organizing secretary, as organizing secretary. She is treasurer of AOGD. Uh, in, she was treasurer of AOGD in 2016, 2017. She is executive member of IFS and accredited with many presentations, faculty lectures and publications and chapters in various books. I would like to welcome all the panelists and uh, we'll uh, have to start panel discussion. In early pregnancy scans, um, Dr. Piki, ma'am, and Dr. Smita, ma'am, please go with us. Uh, so, can I sh share my screen, please?
so without wasting any time we will proceed to case number 1 Uh, is my uh, screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is case number one, and uh, I would la like Dr. Smita Dube to take this one. So this is a primary patient. She's twenty nine years old. She's been married for five years. She has come to us with pain abdomen and amenorrhea of one and a half months. On probing, she gives a history of tuberculosis in childhood. for which she has been treated fully and completed ATT course for 9 months you get a upt done and it is positive so uh, can you see the screen here dr smita yes ma'am yes ma'am so i can see like my screen give your comments on the screen yes what can you see I yeah. think in the yeah. first image, uh, because yeah. the UPT is positive and she is yeah. one and a half months pregnant, that means around six weeks. I have heard, as I have heard in the earlier lectures, at yes. six weeks we can see the gestation sac, but the gestation gestation sac is not visible here. Only right. the endometrium can be seen, and there is right. slight uh, fluid in the pouch of Douglas. Yes, very right. So there is fluid in the pouch of Douglas, and there is no intrauterine sac. So, what will be your thoughts on these findings? Um, because her she has a history of tuberculosis and her UPT is positive. I think she is uh, uh, ART conceived. I mean, she's not ART conceived. No, not ART conceived. Yeah. But because she has a history of tuberculosis, maybe uh, her tubes might be damaged, and there is a chance of ectopic pregnancy. Looking at the USG findings. So uh, for further test, we'll go for a serum beta SCG quantitative test. Correct. So she was high, hemodynamically stable. On per abdominal examination, there was tenderness, and on pelvic examination, she had cervical motion tenderness. Uterus was normal, and a vague mass was felt in the left. So uh, yeah, you magnified this view, and uh, you can see a sac outside the cavity. Uh, so, what is your diagnosis, ma'am? Sac outside the cavity is most likely uh, ectopic pregnancy, but then we have to rule out a put uh, like you have uh, put this image. We have to put color Doppler also to uh, confirm it. But then there could be some TO mass also other than uh, ectopic. So the uh, best uh, to uh, confirm is serum beta hCG test, a quantitative test, and repeat it again. Serum beta hCG. Uh, will be helpful. We can repeat it after forty-eight hours, and as Dr. Smita was explaining, you see the rise or the fall, and that way you can decide. But we yes. need to see what is the location. So we magnified this place where she was saying she is having pain, and we could see a small sac, and here we could see this tubercle, as Dr. Smita had shown us nicely. And on putting it on end mode, we could see the. Uh, we could visualize the fetal heart activity also. So, what is the criteria for ultrasound diagnosis of tubercle ectopic, Dr. Smita? Uh, uh, there is no uh, gestation sac in the uterus. There was slight uh, fluid in the pouch of Douglas. Uh, beta urine pregnancy test was positive, and other findings also. There was mass palpable, cervical tenderness. She was having pain. very right and then we could see on magnification we could see the uh, gestational sac with the fetal pole and the embryo inside uh, yes. and the cardiac activity was activity also was there in the yes. so that means this is a 100% we are sure that this is a tubercle pregnancy mm -hmm. and uh, if there is a pseudo sac we have to differentiate it from intrauterine pregnancy pseudo sac is just collection of fluid as uh, we heard in dr gurd's lecture and it is a pointed one and it is present in the center and on probing with the tvs probe it will move whereas if it is an intrauterine pregnancy it will be eccentric in position and it will have a double decidual sign that is a hypoechoic lesion and around it two echogenic uh, uh, concentric rings dr uh, gurd has beautifully illustrated this point how to differentiate between pseudo sac and intrauterine pregnancy and also you rightly said that there was fluid inside the uh, pelvic cavity and uh, in 28 to 50 per, 6% there could be a uh, sliding uh, sign positive 
because it is different difficult to differentiate whether it is the tube or the ovary so what you can do is you just put your hand over the abdomen not the abdomen press it uh, can you mute others please so that the uh, tube will get displaced from the ovary and you will be able to see it separately and then you can be sure that it is not an intra uh, ovarian lesion it is in the tube and the most common sign uh, which is uh, seen is the tubal ring or the bagel sign or the blob sign this means that you see a empty gestational sac in the place of the tube so very correctly uh, told by dr smita so dr smita what are the treatment options uh, ma'am in this case we cannot go for medical management uh, because cardiac activity is present but otherwise if uh, cardiac activity is absent and the size is less uh, gestation sac size is less than 3 uh, 3.5 cm yes, then we can go for medical management but yes. in but in this case we have to go for laparoscopy so what will be your choice of surgery um, i think laparoscopic uh, salpingectomy i mean okay. i'm i'm not doing laparoscopic surgeries okay but, uh, so yeah. uh, uh, would you ever go for uh, salpingectomy can it be done and uh, any advantages or downsides Uh, I, uh, yes, it can be done, but yes. if it is uh, if it is ruptured, then no question. If it is uh, not ruptured, then we can go for it. I mean, we can open and see. If it might be a tubal abortion also. Then we can preserve, but then there are chances we have to uh, repeat beta CG, and uh, sometimes the trochoplastic tissue is left behind, so we have to follow and give me for next day. And uh, otherwise, uh, we can uh, then, uh, for next pregnancy also we have to advise her also to be careful because there are chances of ectopic pregnancy in the next time also. In any ectopic pregnancy, there are after one ectopic pregnancy ten percent chances of repeat ectopic, and after two or more, then there are more than twenty five percent chances. So anyway, this lady has a history of tuberculosis, so we have to tell her she has to be extremely careful. But Dr. Smita. correctly said that uh, the actually when the you are taking out the tube of a patient the patient has such an emotional trauma so so many times they plead that please don't take out the tube and uh, you can just do a linear uh, salpingectomy and take out the material but the problem is that there is risk of persistent trophoblastic tissue which is there and she may need uh, methotrexate or sometimes it may rupture later on again and she may we may need to resort to salpingectomy so this is a video piki can i add something here yes yes please can i just add something here yes doctor uh, piki regarding the salpingectomy even if you think you before doing a salpingectomy we should always see the contralateral tube right if it is unruptured ectopic pregnancy and you have to see the con how the tube is if it is well good enough then maybe you can think of going and doing a salping technique but even if the other tube is bad then then you have to take a call maybe if it is unruptured maybe salping gastrostomy may help it that so that is another thing that before cutting any tube we should see the other side of the tube as well yeah very right very right doctor you so why my videos are not running hey man madam please remove the pointer you remove the pointer yeah. and then i will be able to do that yeah okay 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 pointer yes yes no no don't take the pointer don't take the pointer how do i remove it dr smita ma'am again click on the click pointer button on the pointer okay. yes yes thik and again yeah healthy or it is also diseased or there is a hydrosalping so we need to assess at this point and now we are trying to hold the fimbrial end of the tube 
and we can start the uh, salpingectomy from the lateral sides. The practice point is that we need to stay as close to the tube as possible so that the blood vessels going to the ovary, the ovarian blood supply is not disturbed. So we start from the lateral sides and we are using the harmonic here and we proceed towards the medial end. So when we reach towards the medial end, we need to cauterize this medial part near the corno. Otherwise, this may lead to a uteroperitoneal fistula. And now we will just carry on with the salpingectomy from the lateral side to the medial side. This is a very small clip again of tubal salpingostomy. After stabilizing the tube, we are giving a nick on the thinnest and the bulging portion where the fetal sac uh, can be seen. And immediately the fetal uh, part and the POCs come out, we are extracting them. And with the help of irrigation and then the use of forceps, we are taking out the rest of the POCs and the trophoblastic tissue. We just confirm that nothing is left behind because otherwise it will take a very long time to get resolved. So this is it. But the thing is that uh, we will have to monitor this patient with serial beta HCG done every month. So the next point is, next case is uh, Dr. Nidhi, we would like you to discuss this. This is a 29 year old primary gravida married for eight years. She's undergoing IVF and two embryo transfers have been done. Her serum beta HCG comes positive. Uh, she's very happy. But then she reports to the emergency department with complaint of severe pain in the abdomen at five weeks, five days gestation. And this is the video that Dr. Smita made. So we can see two gestational sacs. This is the tube and here you can appreciate the intrauterine pregnancy with the fetal pole. So Dr. Nidhi, yeah, uh, yes. I would like you to please comment on this picture. We can see a clear intrauterine sac in this picture. And there's yes. another sac-like structure in the adenexa which can be seen. So uh, yes. because uh, she has conceived after artificial reproductive technique IVF, so there are chances that this patient might be having heterotopic pregnancy because heterotopic pregnancies are very common in the ART these days. Spontaneous heterotopics are less common, but patients who are undergoing ART, there is always a risk of uh, heterotopic pregnancy. So we should always uh, see the adenexa while doing a first trimester scan in these patients. We can see a um, sac in the intrauterine, in the uterine cavity also, and a sac-like structure in the adenexa also. And the patient is complaining of uh, severe pain in abdomen. So most probably, this is a case of heterotopic pregnancy, where the ectopic pregnancy has either ruptured or is about to rupture. So very, very correctly said. There is This is a beautiful 3D picture of the intrauterine and the tubal uh, mm -hmm. ectopic. And so, the, of course, it is a heterotopic pregnancy. So why we see more uh, uh, cases of heterotropic pregnancy in ART is because uh, we are maybe pushing too many embryos inside. And because when we are putting the embryo catheter for transfer of the embryos, it may initiate uh, uterine uh, contractions. Because of it, the embryo may be pushed inside or maybe the uh, observed, the person who is putting the embryo inside has directly put it into the tube or maybe the volume or the number of embryos is so much that it goes inside. So these are the possibilities because of which the uh, chances, the prevalence of ectopic, heterotropic pregnancy is 1 in 100 in mm -hmm. ART pregnancies as compared to 1 in 30,000 in a natural cycle. And uh, as Dr. Nidhi and Dr. Smita had said, previous history of ectopic, previous salpingectomy, salpingostomy, reconstructive tubal surgery, 
or history of tuberculosis all these things may uh, make the person prone to heterotrophic pregnancies um, so sir, i would like to add one more thing in this because nowadays uh, on uh, those emergency contraceptive pills are very common and i have seen that so many patients who have taken emergency emergency contraceptive pills when they get get pregnant they also sometimes land up in uh, tubal pregnancy very right pregnancy. and the other thing is that when the iucd actually it prevents pregnancy but mm -hmm. if the patient becomes pregnant with a copper t or an iucd then the mm -hmm. chances of ectopic pregnancy are very very high more than 50% higher intra uterine contraceptive devices they prevent the intra uterine pregnancies i would say yes. they don't they, prevent ectopics they will just prevent the pregnancies no. but if the pregnancy will occur it will be in the it is most likely going to be in the tube mm -hmm. so the uh, 70% of these are diagnosed between 5 to 8 weeks 20% between 9 to 10 weeks and 10% after 11 weeks so the points of diagnosis dr nidhi would you like to tell us what are the points of diagnosis you have already said this most important key insight that we all need to remember is that more careful scanning of the ectopic exa through tbs has to be done even if intra uterine pregnancy is confirmed please keep your eyes open and try to also check the ectopic exa because a heterotrophic pregnancy may also be there. because we get relaxed once we see an intrauterine yes. sac we are relaxed at the patient is conceived normally but there are chances that there might be one more pregnancy in the tube so we should uh, properly check the adnex also because uh, if there is an intrauterine pregnancy the signs of pregnancy are uh, common to both the tubal pregnancy and the intrauterine pregnancy yeah. uh, once the patient uh, once the, it starts to rupture or starts to enlarge then only the patient will start uh, presenting with symptoms and signs of ectopic like abdominal pain uh, peritoneal irritation uh, signs like that she she might not be having vaginal bleeding also so it is difficult to diagnose uh, a heterotopic pregnancy unless uh, until it ruptures very very nicely told uh, differential diagnosis for heterotopic pregnancy i think we have already discussed pseudo gestational sac pseudo gestational sac uh, uh, pregnancy right. tubal see with a pseudo gestational sac or sometimes there can there can be a corpus luteal cyst or Very some kind of intrauterine cyst which can be misdiagnosed as an ectopic pregnancy and we can uh, uh, we can uh, confirm it by doing the sliding sign that uh, both the presenters earlier had told us so in unruptured tubal ectopic what is the medical management eligibility criteria uh, if the patient should be hemodynamically stable that is uh, uh, her vital right. should be normal the ectopic right. mass should be not more than 30 3.5 cm as a 35 mm and the cardiac activity should not be there and the serum beta hcg level should be less than 1500 international unit then we can go for medical management but uh, because this is a heterotopic pregnancy uh in this we have to save the conserve the intrauterine pregnancy so it is better to avoid medical management because of the toxicity of methotrexate and potassium chloride it is preferable to treat these patients with a surgical um, treatment instead of medical management excellent so we know that uh, in unruptured ectopic we could use medical management by systemic or local methotrexate which is a total no no because the woman has a precious pregnancy and she wants to continue her intrauterine pregnancy so a local infiltration of kcl may be done and i was reading up it was a very interesting new paper that they are using letrozole which is a aromatase inhibitor for 10 days they are using 2.5 mg uh, and this uh, kills the baby of course we cannot use it in this but it can be used for tubal pregnancies or cervical or uh, scar site pregnancy Arthur. when we don't have a intra uterine pregnancy we, and they have got a very good result and the good thing is that the change in the liver function test and the uh, dropping down of the tlc and hemoglobin all those things are also avoided so the, some new recent rcts are being done for this and uh, the surgical approach is still viable we can go for a laparoscopic salpingostomy or a laparoscopic uh, salpingectomy and this will not disturb the intrauterine pregnancy uh, uh, at all 
and in case it is a ruptured ectopic then of course we will have to resort to salpingectomy this is a very small video so in this we can see i hope you are able to appreciate the intrauterine uh, pregnancy and there is a small sac in the uh, tube also can you appreciate it yes yeah. and here yes. we are trying to inject uh, kcl in the sac we take about 3 to 5 ml of kcl and uh, 2 milli equivalents per ml and with a 20 gauge needle we are injecting it inside the sac if the fetal pole is more than 1 cm it can be injected directly inside the uh, fetus so this was a small clip and uh, thank you and now i uh, request dr smita to carry on. dr smita i'll stop sharing and you can yes. please share yes give me a moment please Oh. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Make it slide show, Doctor Smith. Yeah, yeah. It's visible, Doctor. Oh. So, Doctor Renu, we will discuss the third case with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a lady, Mrs. A. P. Thirty-eight year old, third gravida. She is para two life two with previous two cesarean sections, and she is nine weeks three days by her L. M. P. and she has a complaint of heavy bleeding since 10 days these are her ultrasound images so would you like to interpret these images please the first uh, image. Uh, thank you smita for this uh, question uh, i think so now because of the cesarean scars the cesarean pregnancy rate is increasing and this is what we have to really look now and this is what we are seeing in the lower uterine cavity and in the upper cavity is empty it looks like a more towards a scar pregnancy okay can you have any kind of differential diagnosis for it this looks more towards uh, with increased blood flow as well and the uh, even the cervical canal is empty in this so it's more towards a scar pregnancy definitely but what exactly happened interpretation of images you have told now if you think it is a scar pregnancy what could be the next plan that we can think about for this lady so this patient should ideally be admitted and then we should see mm -hmm. what is the size of the what is the size of the scar how much is the distance of the myometrium from the scar and the from the uh, from the bladder as well as uh Hello, can you hear me now, Piki? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Doctor Renu, if you could please repeat because in between there was loss of contact. I think. The uh, Smita, I just wanted to tell you that we have uh -huh. to differentiate this from the cervical pregnancy because uh -huh. at times these scar pregnancies do look like the cervical pregnancy, but in cases of cervical pregnancy there will be ballooning of the cervix, and the, in cases of scar pregnancy this. cervical canal will be empty the upper cavity of the this thing will be empty where is somewhere nearer to the isthmic region we can see the scar when near the the pregnancy and then we have to see what is the thickness of the myometrium between the bladder and the scar that's very important for it huh. but actually what had happened when this lady was seen first it was like you can see on the second image it was thought to be retained product of conception so with that thought they take they took her up for dnc and when the surgeon oh. started doing so that's the dnc the... yes that's the reason we are discussing this case you know because the commonest diagnosis that a lady coming as pregnant with bleeding periods in some time with certain tissue the important point that we need we want to highlight here is do keep cesarean scar ectopics also into your consideration now with this case what happened it was considered to be rpoc and she was posted for dilatation evacuation what do you think could have happened next she must have bled like anything yes 
as soon as the TNC was started, the patient bled profusely. And then it was like, what exactly is happening? Na? So uterine temporad was uh, done with a Foley's catheter with blood transfusions and she was shifted to ICU. First, she was stabilized. Luckily, with that temporad, she had stopped bleeding. And then MRI was done the next day, which confirmed that it was a scar pregnancy and that scar was impending rupture kind of a thing. So it's a nice video that I made out of this images. Later on the retrospective diagnosis now that it's a scar pregnancy, the cervix was seen and the uterine cavity separate. That was the MRI. I'll take you directly to the bookmark only. And then she was opened up laparoscopically. Because since it was the impending rupture, so then with previous two live issues, they opened her up. I'll take you to the bookmark so that we specify the thing. The uterine arteries were skeletonized, both the sides, ureters were identified. And then here you can see, here you can see the scar area that was about to rupture. So that was the near miss case, I would say, that we had. So retro re-evaluation of the findings that would you like to uh, reiterate now, Dr. Reddy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is what I was just trying to say that we have to be very careful when trying to see where the pregnancy is. The location has to be de defined very clearly. So in cases of scar pregnancy, you see that the upper cavity is empty. There will be no sac over there. The cervical canal will also be empty. You will be some near the scar area. You will be some. You will be seeing the pregnancy over there. That means in the near in the isthmic area, that has to be seen. Then we have to see that the circulation, how much vascularity is having. They are very vascular because of the uterine artery very close to there. So that has to be seen. And then what is the thickness of the myometrium in relation to the pregnant scar as well as to the bladder? Whether it is more of an exogenous scar pregnancy or whether it is more of an endogenic scar pregnancy. So that has to be seen. Suppose, uh, I mean, any other way of management, suppose we are just doing an early pregnancy scan and we have an open mind now, keeping into consideration the history of previous sections. And then we find such kind of, we have such kind of findings. So any role of hysteroscopy in such cases? Uh, yes, Mehta, people have tried all sorts of treatment for oh. these scar pregnancies. Even hysteroscopy has been done. And then they have uh, taken out the, because that is under guidance. So they have taken out all of the pregnancy and then the bleeding has been controlled by a roller ball as well. So that can also be done. Then people have also taken uh, methotrexate treatment has also been given, though the literature doesn't support systemic more. Uh -huh. uh, systemic methotrexate, maybe it has to do be in a combination kind of thing. You can do for, go for a local methotrexate injection and then maybe with hysteroscopic uh, removal of that mass. Uh -huh. So many different treatments are there. You try natural embolization where the vascularity has been decreased and then uh -huh. you do the suction evacuate the then you do the instoscopic evacuation even people have gone for surgical directly have gone for laparoscopic management okay. as well so maybe i think what kind of setup we are working what all infrastructure we have what is our own experiences they all add to our management regarding yeah. these rare kind of topics and uh, dr smita we had uh, experience last year we had uh, in a series within two months four uh, scar ectopics oh. and uh, we gave systemic as well as local uh, methotrexate. methotrexate and mm -hmm. it took uh, about three to four months to resolve every mm -hmm. week we got the beta hcg done but yeah. they all resolved. so uh, it needs a lot of it needs a lot of courage and patience to wait and patience on the part of uh, uh, the you have to do a very as well as us asking. You have to see whether she's going to, she's compliant and she's going to come back to you. And uh, it was very rewarding to see that the vascularity came down. The size regressed. First two, three weeks, nothing happened, but then the size regressed and the beta HCG started falling down. Oh, and they were all very young patients. So yeah. we did not want to take them for surgery. One of them has conceived also after that. Yeah. So it is... Uh, yes. Depending on the patient's circumstances, <laughs> clinical profile, your experience, you have to uh, tailor-made the 
process. Yeah. And um, another thing I want to add here is that when you are doing a, a scar ectopic, laparoscopic or open, you have to repair the isthmoseal. Is, uh, yeah. Isthmoseal is the one, the defect which is there near the scar, which leads to formation of this placenta over that and then the scar pregnancy uh, yeah. develops. Yeah. So isthmoseal needs to be repaired so that it doesn't reoccur and the placenta accreta syndrome will also be avoided by doing So it. here comes our, what are the recurrence and the risks that are associated when we are repairing all these things? So it can recur in 18% of the cases or if the pregnancy progresses, there might be uterine rupture or placenta accreta syndromes that, that we have to think about and take care in the next pregnancies, isn't it? So, there is a fixed criteria where we have to use methotrexate that the pregnancy should be less than eight weeks, yeah. the myelin yeah. thickness should be enough, and then the beta CG should be less than 5,000. Patients should be hemodynamically stable. Same that way. all should be known. Yes. If beta HCG is high, then the chances of failure are going to be more. Yeah, definitely. Size and this, everything has to be good. Yes. So, that was. For the scar pregnancy, no, I know I'm keeping the discussion a little less so that we finish things in time. Yes. But move to next case. Thank you, Dr. Renu, for that excellent uh, insight into cesarean scar pregnancies. Thank you. Then, uh, Dr. Chakrati, uh, the next case I would like to discuss with you. You're there? Yes, ma'am. I'm. Uh, Mrs. SS, 30 year old, spontaneous conception, primary lady. She comes with amenorrhea three months, complaint of bleeding PV since seven days. And these are her ultrasound images. If you would just give your comment on the images, please. In these images, there are uterine cavity is empty and cervix is uh, enlarged and barrel shaped. And uh, uh, our glass appearance of the uterus because uh, cervix is enlarged to the up to the like body size like size of the body of the uterus so our glass appearance and barrel shaped up uh, cervix and all the product of conception confined to the cervix only mm -hmm. they are low down isn't it low down so i mean what what is your probable diagnosis this may be cervical ectopic pregnancy can it be incomplete miscarriage? Because the products are there. You can see the yolk sac also. But the uh, cervix is not enlarged in, in incomplete uh, abortion like this. But in the process, can we keep that into a differential diagnosis? Yeah, maybe. Because that is a common thing that anybody will think of. That is a common thing that incomplete but, one, that the sac is coming down. Yes. But in, in uh, cervical pregnancy, internal loss is closed and uh, external loss is partially dilated. But if uh, in phase of expulsion, external loss and internal loss both are open. So it's very keen observation that we need to have and uh, then make a diagnosis. Yes. So this pregnancy also, it was considered to be incomplete miscarriage and she was taken up for dilatation and evacuation. So when suction evacuation was started, she bled profusely. And when she started bleeding, uterotonics were given and there was no response to the uterotonics. For profuse bleeding of these uh, cervical pregnancy and undergoing suction evacuation, we can use Foley's catheter balloon tamponade also. Yes, that, that will help to good a great extent. Yes, yes ma'am. So when they did not respond to the uterotonics and this reconsidering all the findings, a clinical diagnosis of cervical pregnancy was made. So would you like to enumerate the criteria, sonographic criteria for the cervical pregnancy, Dr. Chakrati? Empty uterine cavity, barrel, sub, um, barrel sub cervix, products of conception confined to the cervix only, and negative sliding organ sign. And that is very important, the negative sliding organ sign, because in the time when we are doing incomplete miscarriage and all that, we have to see and try to differentiate this. Yes. So for this lady, for her acute management, 
a cervical cerclage was put and packing was done. And this is how the bleeding was controlled. Of course, blood transfusion and FFPs were given. And then this packing was removed later on. So would you like to comment something more about the cervical pregnancies, Dr. Chakrati? Yes, if patient is hemodynamical, hemodynamically stable, then we can also try medical management like methotrexate. Also can be used for cervical pregnancy that has good results. And uh, if patient is not hemody hemodynamically stable, then uh, to be taken for dilatation, evacuation, if bleeding, then uh, Foley's catheter with balloon tamponade is used. And sometimes patient may be landed up in hysterectomy with cervical pregnancy. That's what we want to avoid every time, isn't it? Yeah. So, so you try an artery embolization or internal iliac ligation can also be tried. And methotrexate, I mean, would you like to use it systemic methotrexate or local one? What would be your approach? What would you like to do? Uh, can we use systemic with leuco uh, leucovarin? With the folinic acid rescue? Folinic acid rescue. Or if there's somebody who can help you out with the local injection so that at least if it is a live pregnancy then that methotrexate will help in reducing all that. And then later on, we can just follow this pregnancy up. Anybody yes. else having yes. any kind of experience with cervical pregnancies, mm -hmm. they can add to it because they are so rare that we would like to have inputs from anybody who has managed such kind of uh, pregnancies earlier. Uh, madam, we can use the intra, intra sac. We can inject KCL also. Uh, KCL methotrexate, yes. Oh. Or methotrexate directly. We, can mm -hmm. we have injected methotrexate in one case, but uh, later on she bled and we had to do. Uh, she was a multi parous woman and she bled a lot and we had to resort to hysterectomy. hysterectomy. Yeah. I have also seen one case and that is also landed up in hysterectomy. So, I mean, they are really very rare pregnancies, but we have to be really on watch out. And their management is really very difficult at times, mm -hmm. is it? Now we'll move on to the next case, uh, Dr. Ruby. Uh, Dr. Ruby, are you with us? Dr. Yes, Ruby, please unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, Dr. Ruby, uh, would you like to take up this case? Uh, Mrs. XY, 28-year-old with amenorrhea two months. She has come to us with uh, pain in abdomen and she came for third opinion scan. As we all know, patients will and wishes that once a diagnosis has been given by somebody, they want to have a second opinion, third opinion. So when this lady came for a third opinion, she had come to Dr. Chandrakant Garg and I would like to show this small video clip of the scan. So please watch it carefully because you have to interpret the findings. They're very evident, I would say. In this uh, image, we can see the endometrial cavity. There's no sac in the cavity as um, it is eight weeks pregnancy, but no sac is seen in the endometrial cavity. And because this picture is very good, so we can easily see the sac in the ovary and uh, the ovarian cortex is surrounding the sac. But in normal uh, images, it's very difficult to make a diagnosis of ovarian ectopic pregnancy because uh, many times we can confuse with tubal ectopic pregnancy. So, so here lies the importance of transvaginal scan, isn't it? I hope, uh, I think everybody will agree with me on this point. That when we are doing a transvaginal scan, uh, how beautifully it can be demonstrated that it is at the location. It is in the substance of the ovary. We are seeing it very clearly in this clip. Yes, and uh, we can uh, further diagnose it by Spiegelweg work criteria. So uh, these criteria were given in 1878. According to these criteria, uh, we have to see for gestational cell, which is located in the region of ovary then uh, it is attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament and uh, we can find ovarian tissue histopathologically in the wall of sac 
and ovidep on the affected side can be seen so we can diagnose it as a ovarian ectopic not fever ectopic pregnancy and in this pregnancy as you had seen the clip the fetus was very well formed the crl was 41 mm which corresponds to 10 weeks 6 days so by the time she was taking her third opinion she had reached uh, she has taken ovarian ectopic up to 10 weeks 6 days with a fetal heart rate of 167 and the ovary could not be visualized separately from the other adnexal mass so she was told that this is a ovarian ectopic which is very rare and it will have a very catastrophic end so she has to have herself admitted and get it sorted out what do you think that uh, next step should be what what can be her management options according to me there should be laparoscopy should be done ideally as the size of sac is very much it is more than 8 weeks so we should not go for medical management ideally laparoscopy should be done it is the gold standard for management of um, ovarian ectopic and we, because we should conserve the ovarian tissue as much as possible because uh, uh, in the prognostic factor for uh, ovarian ectopic there is very much chances of fertility after the surgery so we should conserve the ovarian tissue as much as possible so even on the side of ectopic you would like to conserve the ovarian tissue if um, by laparoscopically or if, or we can go for exploratory laparotomy and if uh, the size is very much so we should remove the tube self injectivity we could, we should go for oophorectomy or if tubes are also affected then self oophorectomy can be done okay. depending on the uh, condition of the patient Oh, okay. whenever we are removing the ovary any way the tubes need to be removed because there is no point in no leaving point the keeping the tube the uh, tube ovary is being removed but dr smita why should we remove the ovary we can easily scoop out that and we can just reconstruct the ovary ideally we should save the ovary dr yes. renu it is very very vascular yes. i have i have been putting the stitches itself in the ovary yes. and then the pregnancy yes. is yes. such yes. advanced one almost yes. it is reaching yes. 11 weeks It's so a very big baby, the and it will be disastrous. The message should that we should try to in case it was bleeding or something one. like that. We cannot. But ovarian tissue, right. ovarian tissue that too in a pregnant state. I mean, it has got so it much of blood supply. It will be very, very bloody. And you in the moment we put a needle or put yes. a prick it, it will be bleeding heavily. Bleed a lot. Hmm. Hmm. we can can we think of uh, medical management in such cases uh, dr ruby and i think size is very big so we should size not consider yes. yes. no uh, leaving apart this case this is a exceptional one taking a uh, ovarian ectopic up to 10 weeks six days and uh, hunting for third opinion fourth opinion and then but then if the size is small the cardiac activity is not there we have localized it yes there is a yeah. the option of medical management there is yes yeah. so definitely we all would like to go for a surgical management but i'll tell you the real story of this lady even after the third opinion pregnancy reaching up to 10 weeks 6 days this lady carried on the pregnancy one more month and then it ruptured and then she was rushed to the medical college in a state of shock she was given 16 transfusions and definitely her surgery was done then so at times even if the diagnosis is made patient do land up in problems so these were our rare cases of ectopics that we all uh, discussed i hope that after this everybody will keep all eyes ears everything open when we are doing a early pregnancy scan not to see only the intrauterine gestation but to see the tube ovary and nexa everywhere in the pelvis yeah smita i also want to just add i do tell the residents that when you think of ectopic then only you will see ectopic if you don't Very think true. of ectopic you will never see this was the learning from state from our teachers they said they you have to think for ectopic location. first to see for ectopic now renu not yeah, just yeah. the two but the rare locations also need to be checked car ectopics are becoming very very rampant so we have to and it's mandatory to do a no you have so, to see the uterus you have to see both ovary separately then only separate. you both can you become confident you know at times they just don't see the ovary you can see the ovary separately another thing is that the beta hcg levels should be done from one lab 
and reliable lab. Not yeah. that they are being done from different labs. Yeah. Because the residents get it done sometimes from yeah. the hospital, sometimes from Lal's lab. And the reports are very variable. We cannot, the uh, radiologist yes. who is doing the ultrasound should be preferably same. And the uh, uh, lab should also remain the same because there could be inter-observer variations and it should be confirmed by a, a technically very sound senior radiologist, a very experienced radiologist because sometimes we will not be able to make the diagnosis ourselves. So a person like uh, Dr. Smitha, a fetal medicine person who are trained in doing radiology, it is always good to take a second opinion and confirm by doing a follow-up ultrasound and correlate with the clinical that is very very important for, for all cases one more thing i would like to add we should tell the patient as well at times many times it happens that pregnancy of unknown location but yes the beta hcg is there we are not able to find we should be open to the patient and tell them that we are not able to find it such situations they happen we may say that i need to have a second opinion or maybe i'll see you in three days or seven days no, because definitely. when we look at your face that why are you saying like this but then there is no harm in admitting and asking them to come back instead of ending up in a catastrophic uh, situation. It has to be a shared decision after telling them the risks, benefits of medical treatment, surgical treatment, conservative surgery, or total uh, tubic uh, salpingectomy or, or expectant management. And realizing that any time she may need surgery yes. or she may land up into hemoperitone and take a written informed consent in all cases because medical legal things are really all our defensive practices every time yes. <laughs> so with this thank you uh, i want to thank all of you dr smitha dr uh, all the panelists they have been excellent uh, and thank you dr smitha for the beautiful videos and your uh, lecture and dr chandkant also and I would like to thank Dr. Priya and the Sagar Obzengaini Society of the Spirits and request Dr. Renu, uh, my co-convener, to give the formal vote of thanks and conclude the session. Uh, thank you, Piki. And I know I have I take this opportunity to thank each one of you. And I would like to thank the IFS MP chapter, Secretary Dr. Priya, and then there's a webinar convener, Dr. Smith. Then, in Dr. Renu's voice, option internet instability, early pregnancy, like and also Dr. Survi, the main person, and every being there. And uh, all the time, and Dr. Smitha for us, and thank moderator Dr. P. K. and Smitha for moderating it so well. I also thank the test, uh, team and for supporting us, and it's a nice winner in the master set. Thank you so much. Thank you. and I come to this day now with this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rini. And it was very nice meeting you, people, Dr. Smitha, Dr. Sandhya. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, one important thing that everybody should know that uh, the webinar on the same link, it will be available for later to be seen. So uh, anybody who wants to revisit, they can see on the same link the whole situation. I hope Dr. Priya will anyway send us the recording because we will put up in the IFS website also. Both your lectures were very good. So Thank we would so like everyone uh, nationwide to have the benefit of your talks. Thank you. Thank you so much for the I'm appreciation. Hoping to associate Thank with you. you again in future. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. It was, Thank it you. was wonderful to be associated with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.